Hi, welcome to Evidence for Faith. I am so glad you're joining me today as we continue in our series, David's Guide to Leadership. This is lesson number eight today, and uh, this one is sort of related somewhat to the last lesson, lesson number seven, but this one takes a little different twist to it. And this is uh, a lesson I call Reacting to Problems. Yes, re reacting to problems. We all have problems in our lives. All sorts of things pop up just in everyday life. How do you react to them? Well, we can learn a lot from 1 Samuel 25, the passage we're going to be studying today, and looking not just at David today, but also looking at another character. Her name is Abigail. But let's get into the lesson, first of all, by praying. Father God, we thank you for this time, and we just ask that your Spirit, again, would uh, open up our minds and our hearts to see things clearly. The Lord, help us also to make changes in our lives that would make us more and more like you, because, Lord, we do face difficulties throughout our days that we live here in this fallen world. So help us um, make things clear as we go through this and bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I have uh, a former teacher, as many of you know, and <clears throat> I want to tell you a story, a true story that happened to me many years ago. The school where I was hired, and I've taught in many schools, but in this one school, I'm going to let it just remain nameless. The school where I was hired to teach was millions of dollars in debt. They had just hired a new superintendent who promised to get them out of the hole and at the same time increase the extremely low scores the students had in state tests, particularly in science. That was where I came in. I was challenged to write a science curriculum for these students in grades one through eight that would raise their test scores and at the same time increase their interest and love of science. Though the school was in massive debt, the school board and the superintendent promised me thousands of dollars to get the job done. And they followed through on this promise. One, I was given the largest classroom in the school, which was on the third floor, in between a social studies classroom and an English classroom. My room was a large, big, empty room with six large walls, four very oversized chalkboards. On opposite sides of the room were doors that opened into the other classrooms next to me, the social studies and the English room. Um, now, one of my challenges was to redesign this room into a science lab. That would take time. And so the first order of business, since I had only a month before school started, was to choose a book series for the grades and then order science equipment just to get us started this year. The plan was for the first year to use part of my science curriculum from my previous school I had been using while I made designs for the room and planned the curriculum for the future. That was what this first year of my contract was supposed to be. I recall that this school had nothing when it came to science equipment. Any materials I did find were so old they qualified as antiques. Since I had only a month before school opened, I immediately began purchasing basic science equipment that I knew I would need regardless of what curriculum was chosen. So I ordered things like microscopes, uh, folding chairs and, and tables and um, electrical extension cords. I ordered test tubes, beakers, containers to hold water, portable sinks, certain chemicals, et cetera, just all sorts of basic stuff just to get started. Well, not long after the school year began, I soon started finding peculiar notes on my desk in the morning when I came in. They would have written on them things like, quote, I hate you, unquote. Quote, you're a waste of money to the district, unquote. Quote, get out. We don't want you here, unquote. Quote, I wish you would quit, unquote. Oh, there were so many more. Every morning, I would find at least one note on my desk. Soon after this, I noticed that someone had written with permanent ink on a poster in the teacher's lounge my name and that I was a waste of money and time to the school district. Now, since this was done in the teacher's lounge, I knew for certain that this was a teacher who had it in for me. 
I wasn't sure which one was acting so immature and cowardly, though. Even so, I knew this was not going to disappear on its own. So I began saving every note and derogatory remark by placing them in a special drawer of my desk. And I also decided to try to be as friendly as I possibly could to everyone because I figured that this person must not have a personal relationship with Jesus or be walking closely with him. I thought that this would be an excellent situation to witness to this teacher. But I must admit, reading those every single morning, that was difficult. And that took a lot, put a lot of pressure on me. Several months later, <clears throat> I was summoned to the superintendent's office after school. When I entered, I could tell he was upset. He told me that he had a letter with several offenses that I had conducted or said since coming to the school. He told me to sit down as he began reading each one. I recall thinking, now I know what Christ felt like when he stood before the Sanhedrin. And then I thought, since Jesus was quiet before those who accused him, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. After reading each offense, he would pause for my reaction, but I remained quiet. He would then continue with the next one on the list until he finally finished all of them and said, So, what do you have to say for yourself? Why shouldn't I fire you right now? I vividly remember sitting in that office and praying silently, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to honor you with this. I spoke up and said that one of those things was true, that I did share something with another teacher that you told me in confidence. That was wrong, and I'm asking you to forgive me of that right now. I, I was wrong. I promise I will never betray you again like that. But he said, well, what about the other, like, 50-so complaints? Did you do those too? I calmly replied, outside of the one I admit to you, the others are all lies. He said, oh, I'm supposed to trust your word over the word of the other teachers who have been here for decades. I told him, I can see that this is a witch hunt. Yes, every one of those other statements outside of the one I confess to is a flat lie. I have been mistreated by someone on staff since I got here. Well, I could tell from his expression he didn't believe me. So I said, would you care coming to my room and seeing something, he agreed. And we silently climbed the stairs, going down the halls, entering my room. Sitting on my desk as we entered was another note that I figured would be there. I handed it to him without even opening it and said, this is why you should believe me. Someone here hates me and is trying to set you against me. I get one of these every day. Then, as he took that one, I opened up the dress drawer, pulling it out, and I dumped it on the top of my desk, and all of these notes poured out. He began reading the notes, and within a few moments, he realized the, bio, the, the diabolical act he now found himself a player in. Before I could react, I'm sorry, before he could react, I, I said, there's something else down in the teacher's lounge. If you have a moment, I would like to show you. We walked down to the teacher's lounge, the floor below us, and when he saw what was written on a poster on the wall, he immediately pulled it off the wall and he tore it up. And he said, let's go back to my office where we can talk. I remember neither of us spoke as we traveled the halls back to his office. I could tell he was in deep thought. Once in his office, he apologized to me. He said that he was going to fire me today, but now he could see that he was being played as a pawn in an evil scheme that the teacher who handed him the letter was perpetrating. He asked me to sit down, and he told me how surprised he was at how I had remained calm through all the accusations and was wondering how I was able to put up with this teacher all this time. I told him that I was hoping to win the antagonist over by being kind 
because that's the way the Lord Jesus would want me to act. He asked me to confront her and ask her why she hates me so much, which I did. Long story short, it all came down to jealousy. Her anger was based on jealousy. She was jealous of the money the school district was spending on science classes. She was jealous and very angry of how the students liked me and how they talked about me. Oh, she was jealous that I'd been given even the biggest room in the school as a classroom. It went on and on. Over the years I taught in that district, I never did win her over. But it didn't matter. Jesus was honored. So how do you respond when problems arise? If you're a leader or training to be one, let me promise you something right now. You will have to face problems with an audience. I'll repeat that. You will have to face problems with an audience, people watching you. And because you have this audience, it's crucial that you handle them wisely as Christ would. But that is a hard task, and seldom does every leader handle them correctly. David was a phenomenal leader. He has taken command of a group of malcontents and changed them into a functional, victorious army. In the last lesson, we learned how he handled being in a serious problem when he was the victim. And he led his men in actions that were totally honoring of, of God. He was victorious. But now we see him face another problem that happened not long after. We're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 25. I want to read, this is going to be a longer reading here today, but I want to read... Uh, the first 28 verses of that passage, and then I want to read verses 32, 33, and 34. So if you follow along, this is I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, but you can use whatever translation you have, or you can just sit back and listen to me. Um, so this is 1 Samuel 25. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in a house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran, and there was a man in Manon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, peace to be to your house, peace to be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now, your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let your young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give us whatever at hand, uh, whatever at hand to your servants and to your uh, son David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the, uh, in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I don't even know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we didn't miss anything when we were in the fields, as long as, as we went with them. They were a wall to us both night and day, all the while 
we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against his house. And he is such a worthless man that not one cannot, uh, no one can speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine, five sheep already prepared, five seals of parched grain, and a hundred clusters of grapes, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. Then she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before him on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord uh, whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. And skipping down to verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from avenging myself with my own own hand. For as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who restrains me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left a Nabal so much as one male. David has now command of 600 people. Did you catch that as the story goes, as it began? He has 600 total soldiers. He has protected Nabal, and it's been a blessing to him and his servants. Now, Nabal just doesn't refuse any hospitality to David's men, but insults them. David then reacts in the height of human flesh. He says, every man strap on his sword. And about 400 men went up with David. 400 men to kill one guy, or just a few. Do you think David had enough men to get the job done? I mean, 400 going up against this one little house? I mean, there's an old saying, Confucius say, do not use cannon to kill mosquito. I mean, come on, David. You really need 400 men to kill one man and his small little band of workers? I mean, this is really overkill. You can see how David is just furious and he's not thinking too straight. But David has found himself in a new problem. What is amazing to me is that he seems to have closely followed um, his last problem. He, he did this, and, you know, the last problem he had, he was, he was being hunted and stuff, and now, um, and he didn't let revenge drive its course on him, but now he's starting to let revenge go on. I mean, he, in the last problem, when Saul was trying to kill him, he passed that test, and he, he led his men wisely. Now, just maybe days, weeks, or maybe in a couple months later, we find him leading instead of wisely, like he did in the last lesson, now he's leading very poorly. Can you imagine what some of David's men must have thought? This is the same guy who scolded us last week for telling him to kill Saul, who was trying to kill him? 
What must have been going through the minds of some of David's men about his inconsistencies? Here he pardoned Saul for all the abuse that Saul had done on him. And now this Nabal guy insults David, and David is going to go kill him. Now, before we get down too much on David and give him a hard time for making his poor choice, let's remember, David is human just like us. He has flaws just like us. And I'm sure that if given time to do so, we can recall each one of us some moment when we let our emotions run amok with our leadership abilities. Luckily for Nabal, he didn't live next door to David. I mean, if he had lived right there where David was at, this story would have had a totally different ending. It would take some time for David to move his armies from Paran all the way to Carmel. That's a distance of maybe about 100 miles. Thus, there was time for David to cool down. But David doesn't cool down. Look what he says um, as he's approaching, what it said back in verses 21 and 22. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. This is what David says. He has repaid me evil for good. May God deal with me severely if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. This is a guy who's using the time to get more and more angry. You know, I think God planned to have David living 100 miles away from Carmel and Nabal. Having David live in the in the wilderness of Paran, why? To allow Abigail time to fix up all the gifts that she makes for David. For it's very probable that if David was still living in in Gedi, where he was hiding before in the last lesson, that would only be a distance maybe about twenty miles. David would have committed murder, since David's men would not try and change his mind. There's no mention of them trying to do that. God supplied a woman named Abigail to intervene. I love how she's described in the Bible. Um, I want to read uh, 1 Samuel 25, 3, but this time out of the New American Standard Version. It says, and the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. That word intelligence, that's the Hebrew word sakel. Now, that's from the root word sakal, which we've already mentioned in a previous lesson, meaning for success. It uh, Sakel means more like uh, intelligence. Um, It can mean success, but it's talking about um, using intelligence, knowledge, prudence, good understanding, wisdom, being a wise person. This This describes Abigail. How many times in history, in our lives, is a man corrected from his errors by the wisdom of an intelligent woman? I can't even begin to fathom what that number must be like. How many times a wise woman has curved our anger aside, given us wisdom to react more appropriately. And many times, the way that God would want us to act. You know, let's consider for a moment Abigail. Uh, We don't have time to go into a deep study on this. I mean, we could spend a whole series just on her. No doubt, she was not thrilled with the man she married. And you get that. She's not happily married. And now, all she had to do, do you realize this, to get out of that marriage? All she had to do was just to sit back and hide, for she knew David was coming to kill her husband. I mean, she could have got out of this terrible marriage just by standing aside and going up to Nabal and say, hey, Nabal, um, tonight, since you're celebrating, I'm going over to my, my uh, visit my mother. I'll be back tomorrow with a surprise for you. <laughs> she didn't do that. She didn't act like that at all. Even though she was married to a clog, she took matters into her own own hands and saved his undeserving, filthy life. And she did it right in front of her servants. Did you catch that? She does it right in front of an audience. She is leading. This gal is a leader. Yes, the Bible has the right word for her, Sakel. This gal's intelligent and she is wise. Women, let me speak to you for just a second. There's another lesson here about being married to your husband. Time doesn't allow, as I said, to go into an in-depth study on Abigail. But before you get married, if you're not married yet, before you get married, sit down and I challenge you to take a little study. Read carefully the life of Abigail. It won't take you long to do. But when she said, like, for instance, in a a marriage proposal, um, for better or for worse, 
she obviously meant it. She meant it. Even though she's married to a clod, this uncouth fellow, she stays loyal to him. Amazing. Anyway, David learns an important lesson from Abigail. He's not in, uh, he is not only appreciative of her and her beauty, but David sees God's hand in her. And he repents right before his men and her. Good leaders do that. They're not ashamed or afraid to let people see when they make mistakes. They admit them immediately in front of them publicly. Then they use such events like that as a teaching moment for the audience around them. So Abigail was probably put into a a marriage that wasn't because they didn't marry for love as we basically do today. They were arranged marriages. She was put into a difficult situation. She endured it. She didn't seek to have her husband murdered. She obviously was not trying to divorce him or anything. She was still married to the guy, but she was acting as a witness and her life bears on the way that we should be honoring to God. And that was her. I'm not saying if you're a female in a marriage being abused, and there's no mention here of him abusing her. I'm not saying that Abigail is, you know, getting beaten up every night because that's not there. But he was an uncouth person. I'm saying use wisdom before you get married. Be wise about it. This was a gal full of wisdom, but she was obviously put into a marriage. And she had little say in because that's how it was in that culture back then. So what can we learn? What can we learn from this um, about reacting to problems from this chapter in David's life? Well, I can think of six things that we see here. And number one, David teaches us to let time intervene. Um, By having time from when you have a problem thrust upon you and you start to react, have some time there. You sometimes will get to see the problem as a whole and not just one side of it. You see, God moved David 100 miles away so he would have time to cool down, which even then, David didn't use that well. Men, sometimes we just don't catch things very wisely and and using common sense. David didn't use it well. Instead, he used the time to just build up his anger. But God used it wisely. He used it wisely. We should use the time to pray and ask for God's guidance before jumping into action. The second thing, fight against the urge to react quickly. Time and years have taught me that usually the first reaction I make when someone does something to me in a problematic situation or something like that is almost always the opposite of the way I should react. I have learned that now. I'm still learning it, actually, that when a problem comes up, I sometimes mentally think, okay, this is what my my human side wants to do. My natural side wants to to lash out like this. Okay, what's the opposite reaction to that? Okay, it would be this, and then I'm, okay, I'm going to choose that one. Um, I try because of years, I'm trying to do that um, because I've learned the hard way that my first reactions are usually not good ones. So fight the urge to act, uh, react quickly. Third, watch what you say when a problem arises. David spoke actually of murdering a man right in front of all of his men. What kind of influence was that? What was he teaching them? This was the same man who just before told his men that he would not murder the king. Now he's telling them, hey, put your swords on. We're getting ready for a bloodbath. We're going to go kill this guy who who insulted me. Watch what you say. Fourth thing. David wrote a lot of Psalms. David went through a lot of problems, and he wrote about his problems, and he wrote about his reactions and pouring his heart out to God. We have the book of Psalms. Psalms has many prayers to help you when problems arise. Spend time in prayer asking God to help you fight the natural tendencies to react in the flesh. I'm sure you can go online and look up something like, you know, or, um, whatever your problem is in the book and just attach the book of Psalm and how to deal with anger in the book of Psalms and, and things like this. And certain Psalms will pop up. You can even download, I've seen it many times, a sheet that talks about, um, it's like the 911 of problems, 
but they're all listing psalms to read throughout your problems. You have daily problems and problems in your life or whatever. There are certain psalms David and others have written pertaining to that and the way that we should react to them. And use those. If you can't find one, contact us at Evans for Faith. I will be glad to send you a 911 list of psalms. A fifth thing, use wisdom. Another book of the Bible is the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a great source for wisdom to look up when you have problems. It's actually one to use before you have the problems because it's a book of wisdom. You might find yourself not getting in as many problems if you apply the Proverbs to your life. Seek wisdom before reacting. And then finally, think of how your problem can be used to glorify God. David didn't do that at this moment. The actions of Abigail did. And David even acknowledged that. He thanked God for her. So think about how the problem that comes up can be used to give glory to God. In my situation, I could have reacted in a lot of different ways, but I chose right away, I'm going to try to do this, that Jesus will be glorified. I never did sway this teacher to like me at all. Uh, To the day I left, she never, never appreciated me and constantly gave me hassles, but she never wrote me notes again after the superintendent's thing. Um, That stopped, Um, but I never won her over as far as I know. And so um, see how your problems can be used to glorify God. Let me just close with a story. I I love Chuck Swindle. I love to listen and read his books. Um, He tells a story of how he reacted to a problem. And I'm I'm just going to tell it the way that he wrote it. Uh, it, It's really humorous, but it gets the point across. Chuck Swindoll writes, several years ago, I drove my car to a busy shopping center, and there was a small parking space just big enough for the compact car I was driving. I knew it would be a tight squeeze to get my ample frame in and out of the car without bumping the car next to me, but I was willing to try. Parking places were scarce. My son, who was small then, was with me. He slipped out of his side with no problem, but I gingerly pulled myself out and in the process bumped the car a little bit. It bothered me, so I wiped off the side of his car to make sure it was okay. There wasn't a mark on it. When I came up from that maneuver, the man inside his car was not smiling. I smiled and said, I'm sorry, but there's no damage. He still was not smiling. So I closed the door and with my boy, I started walking to the grocery store. Something told me to turn around and look. Something was gonna happen to my car. Sure as the world, when I turned around, he was already going around his car and he opened the back door of his car and he went smash, smash into my fender. My first reaction was to separate his head from his body. That was my first reaction. But I thought, man, what a scandal this would create. Pastor kills man in parking lot. Hmm. He was bigger than I was, and I thought, how much worse to read? Man kills pastor in parking lot. So I didn't do anything. My little boy had his hand in mine, and I thought, Boy, it would just foul everything up if he saw his daddy out there getting smeared all over the parking lot. So I didn't do anything. Well, I did do something. I applied patience, a rare virtue in my life, and walked away. But you know what? That is a pleasant memory and a rare one in my mind right now. That day, I walked away from the man's from man's natural tendency towards revenge. Father God, we thank you for this time we've had here, and what what a massively important lesson that you give us in, in 1 Samuel 25 with David and also with this wonderful woman named Abigail. And we see that David is human just like we are, and many times we falter and we fall down, and sometimes you'll bring a friend. In this case, with David, it was Abigail, but sometimes, Lord, you'll bring a friend to help swing us around and and help guide us in our thinking. And we need people like that, and thank you for that. And help us, Lord, not to react right away, 
but to use wisdom and always to think, how can we use this? How can I honor God in what's going on in my life? No matter what the problem is, how can I honor you? So help us, Lord, with that. We thank you for this time. And I thank you, Lord, for all those who are listening to the series. I ask the, you the, to bless them. And, Lord, that we can continue to do this until you come again. In Jesus' name and for his glory and honor. Amen. Thank you for joining me today again on this lesson as we have one more to go as in this series. Um, but I've really so far enjoyed this, and I'd love to hear from you as you um, listen to these uh, these uh, podcasts that we're doing, and also to remember that we are listener supported. We we work only by donations, and we are a free ministry um, to go out and and speak at places or whatever. Contact us. Go to our website, uh, evidenceforfaith.org, and check it out. We have so many other lessons there for you also. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.